In this video, I'm going to be commentating over sped up footage of me doing still life painting digitally using a gridded reference image. So I'm just going to run the footage and talk over it and explain kind of what the process is while it runs at 500% speed, which takes a couple hours of painting and puts them down into about 18 to 20 minutes. The first thing that I had to do was to bring in the image and put a grid over the top of it. So this is something that I've actually done in full tutorial on other videos. Uh, so you can look at that. I'll put the link in the description for it. But I'm just taking the reference, fitting it to my canvas, putting a grid over the top and saving it out. And then I pull that up into another monitor uh, and use the same grid, same canvas size to put the pencils in. I like to work over a mid-tone background. So I put in a brown solid color, and then I take a yellow pencil just because it's easy to see, and I go over the top to figure out composition. So I'm not worrying about value, really just placement, and in this case, only roughly considering placement. So you'll notice the shapes are not quite right. Uh, the shape of the apple is pretty wonky. The shape of the uh, ceramic itself is pretty crazy and I don't worry about value or shadows. That's actually one of the good reasons to work in yellow is because it's light colored I don't really get that temptation. Now when I start to go over top of it with another layer this is when I start to think about uh, refining those shapes a little bit. I'm still looking at the reference photo over on the side and trying to think of uh, a little more meticulously about the placement of the edges and you can tell I got the curves wrong there so I tried to go back and fix them a little. And here I do think about shadows. I think about the shapes of shadows and try to include those somewhat in this version. I always like to do multiple pencil layers when I'm working digitally, and I use colors just to help myself mentally keep track of what I'm doing at any given time. So yellow for the placement of objects and for overall composition, and then typically a dark blue for the actual pencil drawing, the underdrawing that just helps guide the painting. None of that will show through. In fact, it should be entirely covered or completely eliminated through the process of painting. Uh, with the cloth, I like to find the edges of it and kind of hint at the value because cloth is complicated and I know much of that work is going to be done during the painting. So I'm not overly concerned with highlighting exactly what those curves will or I'm sorry what those contours will look like or how dark the shadows go etc this is obviously still pretty sketchy all illustration is from the general to the specific so I start with broad strokes and I go in and just increasingly become more precise with each layer as it goes further in but this is really just as a guide so that when I start to put the shadows on top, I can use this as a reference. And also it does something for you mentally to go through the process of sketching it out. Uh, it helps because you've essentially already drawn it before by the time you get to painting. So you could go directly to painting, but this doesn't take very long. It helps me understand the composition and again gives me a guide for the actual painting. So I'll throw in a little value just with some hatching around the edges just to remind myself where some of the darker areas of the background are. By this point, I can typically turn off the grid. You know, once you become pretty developed in uh, illustration, you probably don't want to use a grid anyway. I really use it here just for uh, the example. But eventually you got to get rid of it because it gets in your way. So I just turn it off and I go to using the regular image as a reference rather than the gridded version. Uh, here I go ahead and switch to the paintbrush and I take essentially an umber, a really dark brownish uh, color to paint in shadows and I do essentially a monochromatic version just of the value of the image. And this I actually do paint directly on top of and it helps provide some of the well, it fills in some of the gaps between the paint strokes as I start painting color in by just maintaining some of that value. So a lot of it gets covered up, but not all. And it really helps me get a feel for the shadow and light in the image, even though it doesn't include highlights. It's just mid-tones, because that's the color of the background, and then shadow. But it helps give me a strong sense of it. I'm actually working with... Uh, one of the packet brushes that I provide in class 
and I'm not adjusting its opacity. I'm changing its size constantly. So the size, I'm using the bracket keys on the keyboard to increase and decrease the size appropriately, but I'm not adjusting the opacity at all. I just don't apply as much pressure to the brush, and thus it gives me a lower opacity option. So you can go in and adjust it. A lot of times if I'm doing meticulous work, I will. I'll drop it to 30% if I'm blending colors, etc. But for the purposes of this tutorial, I wanted to keep it really, really simple. So I'm honestly not adjusting it at all. I'm keeping it at 100% opacity and just varying the level to which I press down uh, with the Wacom. So there's the the version, the sort of grayscale version, even though it's over brown. And then I start to identify, looking at the source image, what are the colors that I see in the shadows? In this image in particular, you can see a lot of green in the shadows and a lot of red in the highlights and orange and yellow, things like that. So I just start to paint those in kind of haphazardly. It's really rudimentary. It doesn't look anything like the final image will. But I know that those colors are underneath there, and I'm not concerned about putting something where it shouldn't go, rather just kind of blanking at it with some color, because I know I'm going to go over top of it. Every time I see a different hue, I'll go in and add that to the background. You'll see that happen a bit more later on. Here I actually chose a red that was much too warm, and so I end up cooling it down a little bit, painting the apple, and then going back over the cloth, cooling it down some too. It, never be afraid to put down a hue that's a little bit wrong. You can always cover it, and honestly it's easier to tell once you have something on the canvas that it's off because you can see its relationship to the other colors. Uh, the highlight is one of the particularly strange color areas of this source image. So going ahead and painting those in and recognizing that one is quite a bit more blue and the other is green and then taking some of that orangish brown and painting the streaks you see in the image. So here I'm kind of changing the brush size just looking at the reference figuring out what's missing on any given spot. I really like to take one section of a painting and develop it further and kind of get it out of the ugly stage where everything's just kind of slapped on the canvas but actually develop it and that's why I'm not really touching the cloth barely messing with the background really mostly I just wanted to get the, that central element the ceramic itself looking halfway decent and it keeps it honestly from being discouraging during the painting process uh, this part is important because this is where I'm identifying I just see random hues in that textured background and I just come up with something close to it from the color picker paint a bit of it in if it's wrong go over it if it's right keep it again people get really hung up over getting the right color just paint something on there and then go over it if it's wrong uh, I kept noticing that the shadows weren't dark enough, so I actually go over them repeatedly. If you just watch this without the commentary, you might think it's intentional, but really I'm just being uh, hesitant, I guess, to go that dark for no real reason. That's just something I've always done. It's kind of a weakness of mine. I never go quite dark enough, and then I always have to go over it a couple of times to get that to work. I kept recognizing the background wasn't dark enough, so continually keep adding in some color of darker value uh, to help compensate for that. You can see these moments of hesitation where it is kind of, even at 500% speed, I just sit back and think about it, try to figure out what, what needs to come next. It's really just looking at the reference, looking back at this, what's missing from any given spot on the image. You can probably hear me slurping coffee. Uh, the part that I was dreading is what I move on to here. I, I take a cooled down version of the red and I start working on the cloth. I really don't enjoy painting cloth and honestly what they used for this reference image was very thin so it has lots of wrinkles. And I don't really like that. I like the big heavy cloths that they used in Renaissance paintings. You can look at them, they have these huge geometric folds. I like that a lot more. So uh, I actually got distracted from it pretty quickly. I always dread doing the cloth. I put it off. I'd rather paint just about any surface uh, than cloth, especially thin cloth. There was a little moment there where I recognized there was a lot more brown 
in the ceramic than I thought there was. And so I went in and started spreading that in. And a lot of times I just hold down Alt, use the uh, eyedropper, and pull it from the background or something. So I keep reusing color. Once it's on the canvas, I just kind of keep reusing it. I only go and pull something new from the color picker if it looks like a color I haven't used yet. Uh, for me, that just consolidates the color palette. I painted in those little streaks of brown and then have to take some color from around them and wash over them some so they're not so strong. It makes it feel like it's actually part of the ceramic rather than on top of it. I really struggled with that area uh, that I'm just painting on over there in the background. I just kept looking at it. There's so much texture. To the background I wanted to make sure that I achieved at least enough of it to capture the gist again not looking for perfection not looking to duplicate the photo exactly but I want its essence I want it to feel like the same thing uh, this red that I decided to include here for the highlight is probably a little bit more vibrant than what you get in the reference photo it's pretty intense in this case though I recognized it after the first couple of strokes I thought that's a bit much but I kind of liked it so I just stuck with it uh, very often, a little interpretive cast to the color can be advantageous. It can make for a more interesting image, but you have to kind of make a judgment call about that. Uh, I was still hesitant at this point, though, still trying to decide whether or not I wanted to go back and tone it down, and so I covered it with a little bit of shadowed area so those little spots of really intense red would pop here and there, but not all over. That background where the uh, shadowed area of the cloth is, I actually found that a bit problematic and then finally realized as you just saw what I did there, paint a stroke and put the, uh, the ceramic between two folds of cloth. Uh, it wasn't actually that clear, I feel like, in the reference photo, but it made sense to me once I uh, did it in the painting, so I just kind of kept that slight deviation from uh, the reference and made it a bit more obvious. This is the part of cloth that kills me. It's just looking at the tiny little gradients, going over them again and again. Uh, and cloth, very often you think, well, I can just paint anything then because it's also random and it'll look right. But actually, cloth has behavior. You do have to pay attention to it. So I don't recommend just trying to fudge it. Uh, if you don't get it perfect, that's fine, but it's pretty hard to draw cloth from imagination, have it look like cloth, if you haven't drawn from life many times before or from photograph. Here I'm probably getting too hung up on detail. Hey, one of the reasons why I probably dislike cloth is I'm very uh, driven to try and get it perfect, which honestly is not a good way to think about it. I usually start to feel encouraged though when I see I have that little section of cloth there. It starts to look realistic, especially if I look at the navigator on the left. Because again, that's useful for just getting a feeling of the whole image. And then I feel encouraged because it actually, at least one section of it looks decent and I know I can get the rest of it there. That, again, that's usually why I pinpoint one element uh, to render a little bit further than the rest of the image and then catch the rest of it up uh, because it, I find it encouraging. It gives me kind of a reference point. Okay, I need to get everything looking as good as this part does. And I know that I can because I've already done it. Uh, you tend to lose confidence in the early stages of a painting because it is so uh, ugly you know, when you're just laying down the basic colors. Again, I realized the shadows here were not dark enough, so I finally just pulled it down further. I never like to go all the way towards black, and so I usually avoid it maybe a little too much. So I went in, darkened up the, the values, and then took another crack at it, and I think I got it much closer uh, this time. Again, if you put down the wrong color, you put down the wrong hue, you put down the wrong value, uh, you can always go back and fix it. That's the beauty of digital. You don't have to wait for it to dry. All you do is just look at it and then you fix it. Again, this whole painting, 
uh, which it's it's a loose painting. I didn't want to uh, polish it up too much uh, since this tutorial isn't really geared towards that. So a couple of hours, but that's it's pretty polished for two hours. The idea of doing something like this traditionally using uh, oil would be kind of crazy unless you're one of those uh, artists who can paint wet on wet oil which I can't I have to wait for stages up to dry I can just never uh, get it to behave the way that I want to otherwise that's probably a testament to my lack of skill with oil but it is true you can tell by how much time I'm spending on this cloth that I must really enjoy it it's a ton of fun to watch and return to. It's exciting. You just never know when the next wrinkle will emerge. I actually took my time getting to the apple to the point that I nearly forgot about it. It's just kind of sitting there, lonely all by itself. And eventually I get around to it. Painting fruit is actually pretty enjoyable. I like to paint fruit. Caravaggio did it. If he did it, heaven knows. He's a heck of a lot better artist than I am. So I put together the shadow for it first. I realized it was kind of a lumpy apple. It has these little ridges on it. So right over there inside the shadow, I have that little ridge I just added using the highlight. Um, and then I kind of hedge it away some. But fruit is typically lumpier looking than we anticipate. This is a particularly lumpy apple however finding the right uh, hue for the highlight because it seemed like it had a little bit of blue in it clearly wherever they set this up they were using either a window or a light that mimicked the, the temperature of daylight uh, because there's a slight blue hue to it you can see it on the apple and then also uh, up there on the ceramic uh, the one the highlight facing towards the left clearly there was a window or something there because that is near blue on both of them. It's certainly a cooler version of light than you would anticipate. So a little bit of shadow underneath. I had found also that the apple, which uh, I should have mentioned it before, I had the edge way too crisp. And so you can see with the other objects, I keep the edges loose and painterly looking, but I made the edge of the apple too crisp and it didn't look like part of the same scene. And so I had to go over the edge of it really quickly, soften it up some, loosen it so that it seems less um, digitally precise. Uh, that's one thing that digital illustration can overdo very quickly, is making everything have crisp, hard edges. I had a grad school professor get on me about that, uh, making them much too crisp and not loosening them up and giving them a, a painterly feeling. So at this point, I'm pretty much at the end. I'm just kind of looking at the overall image and trying to figure out what else it needs. That little highlight on top of the table helped a lot, that extra bit. This last one is the only time I change brushes. I take a little rock texture, just kind of go over the background and gently go over it, adding some texture to the overall piece. So that's pretty much the process. Uh, it's not incredibly complicated, but you can very easily, while you're painting, get lost in the process and not know what to do next. The best way that I can describe how to get around that is just always look back at the, your source image, look at what you've painted, and just look for what's missing or what's different. Then come up with a solution for changing it. Trial and error is great. Try something. If it works, fantastic. If not, take another approach. A different hue, a different value, a different brush, a different opacity, a different size. Find some way to approach it, and eventually you'll get it there. The biggest difference between uh, my good painting and my bad painting is very often time. Just taking the time to look at it, figure out what it needs, and come up with a solution. 